Hi, everyone. Um, for, so for the next part of the lecture, uh, I will discuss our work on um, using zebrafish to model seizures. And also, it's actually going to consist of two parts. So the first part is just initially sort of our path or the initial pilot studies we did to convince ourselves that zebrafish was a good model to screen for anti-epileptic drugs. And then the next part of the lecture will be uh, a story where we actually found some very interesting small molecule compounds from a medicinal plant and how there was a bit of a surprise in the story where we were actually looking for, uh, we were just testing it sort of as a random validation of certain medicinal plants that we knew had an anti-epileptic effect, but we, it turned out that the compound that we isolated was not what we thought it was going to be. It was actually an, a new one. So um, without much further ado. So the first part of the lecture is actually um, using pentaline tetrazole, uh, which is a chemoconvulsant used for decades now. It's sort of the golden standard for inducing acute seizures in rats and mice. And it turns out it works beautifully in the zebrafish as well. And um, what we did was, uh, so for our, our large-scale screening of compounds, we actually used the locomotor response, which I'll explain in a minute. And then we also started to record the brain activity and try to correlate the locomotor response or the behavior of the fish with the electrographic changes in the brain. So epilepsy is actually a quite common uh, neurological disorder. It affects about 1% of the world population. An estimated 65 million people worldwide are afflicted with some form of epilepsy or undergo seizures. And um, of this 1%, about 30 or even 40% are drug resistant, which means that among the 35 or so anti-epileptic drugs on the market today, about a third of them do not respond to these drugs. And so you can imagine that this re seriously affects the quality of life of these patients. And some, a very small subset of these can be cured or treated through surgery, but that's a very small subset. And even after surgery, sometimes they still get seizures. So clearly there's a need to discover new anti-epileptics, and that's, well, what, what motivates us in part. Um, Epilepsy is a very heterogeneous disease. It can be generalized, meaning it affects both hemispheres of the brain. It can be partial, which means it'll only affect one hemisphere, convulsive, non-convulsive, uh, spontaneous, or even triggered. But the main hallmark of epilepsy is that you basically uh, see synchronous discharges in the brain, so synchronous neuronal activity. And the aim of treatment is to reduce this neuronal overexcitation, but without impairing normal function of the nervous system. Uh, because a lot of anti-epileptics actually have some serious side effects, such as severe sedation. Um, one of our technicians, former technicians in the lab, his girlfriend has epilepsy. Uh, so she suffers from absence seizures, where basically uh, they don't, I guess some people perhaps here in this audience have seen the grand mal seizure, where you have the, you know, the tonic-clonic but some seizures, some people, if you're not an expert, you wouldn't even know that the person is actually undergoing a seizure. They're unconscious and they're just staring in space uh, and they're actually undergoing a seizure and they don't remember the event. But anyway, you know, you have severe weight gain, um, hyperactivity, all kind of uh, mood disorders. So there are clearly many side effects uh, of these drugs. So, <laughs> Another thing about epilepsy is that it's very, very difficult to simulate, obviously, seizures uh, because it, it involves a lot of locomotor response in vitro. And therefore, rodents, rats, and mice mainly have become the sort of main model of choice. And for now, so for many decades, uh, the pentaline tetrazole seizure assay and the maximum electroshock test have been the golden standards for looking for anticonvulsant compounds. However, this is not exactly applicable for large-scale screening because it's not easy to screen lots of compounds using rodent models. They're very expensive, it's very time-consuming, um, and of course, for ethical reasons, it would be good to reduce the number of mammals used in experimentation. So that's where the zebrafish come in, comes in, and it's a, relatively speaking, a very new model in the field of epilepsy research. And there are a number of examples which 
Alex already pointed out. Mainly their small size, which means that you, for testing, you only need very, very small amounts of compound. Uh, in addition, you can assay everything in 96 well format, and actually the, uh, we're now trying 384 well format. So um, they develop very rapidly. So these are seven day old uh, larvae. And uh, by seven days, however, all the neurotransmitter systems are present and active in the brain. That's important, of course. And it's an aquatic organism, which means you don't need to inject water-soluble drugs. You just simply bathe or treat them in the well. And for high-throughput screening, you can do everything automated. Right. So um, pentaline tretrazole acts by suppressing the GABAergic system. Uh, just a brief introduction. So the GABAergic system is your main inhibitory neurotransmitter system. It's what allows you to sit here and listen to me without jumping around or moving spastically. Uh, it's also very important for uh, pain modulation, among other things. Uh, and essentially, if you over-activate the receptors, you'll induce sedation or even myorelaxation. And pentaline tetrazole acts to inhibit the GABAergic uh, signaling. So it's essentially an inhibition of the inhibitor. <laughs> and so you get over -ex excitation of the neurons, leading to excitation, spasms, and seizures. So. And what you'll see here is actually a movie. So this is just normal embryo medium, so vehicle treated fish, as we call it. And this is a pentaline tetrazole fish. These are seven day old larvae. And as you see here, the controls don't move much at this stage of development because they're simply uh, living off their yolk, so they conserve a lot of energy. Whereas this one is quite a bit more active, and it goes on different there's whirlpool movement, that's stage two seizure. And then if you watch carefully, it'll rotate onto its back, so it goes belly up. But it's actually still alive, heart rate is fine. And if you take it out of here, so they'll continue this for hours. Uh, eventually, if you leave it in there, they'll die because, I mean, imagine if you ran around <laughs> for 24 hours, I think we'd also not feel too, too good. Uh, but essentially, um, there are different stages that we can, we can monitor using a video tracking system. And uh, if you take it out of here, though, and wash it out, they're fine. So it's, a, it's an acute response, but also transient. And just to uh, sort of illustrate how we track our fish, so this is our locomotor assay. This is a larva in a well of a 96 well plate. This is uh, schematized here in this dr drawing. And essentially we use 10 to 12 larvae per compound concentration or, or vehicle control. And um, this is our, these are our zebra boxes from the company Viewpoint, they're based in France. And they're the ones who developed this tracking system. There's also, there are other companies such as Nolis in the Netherlands, but we use the viewpoint system. And um, so you basically give your different treatments to the fish. Each well has one larva. And uh, you put them in this box, which is dark, so that there's no other stimulus. And they're monitored using an infrared camera. And so all their activity, so every time the larva moves, it's a change in pixelation. And it's that total change in pixelation that's recorded and interpreted and quantified by the software. And what you see here are actually traces of a control versus a PTZ-treated fish. Right. Uh, in addition, we have now added electro, so EEG recording, so brain recordings from the fish. And I'll explain that in more detail. And essentially what you see here is uh, a seizing zebrafish larval brain uh, in response to pentaline tetrazole. This is the vehicle control. As you see, there's much, not much activity there. And this is in the presence of diazepam, which is a well-known anti-epileptic drug. So it's, it was when we started this, actually it was already known that zebrafish, uh, the PTZ uh, can induce seizures in zebrafish, that they become hyperactive, they have different stages and stereotype seizure-like behavior, um, and that you could record epileptiform discharges in the brain. A couple of years later, after this first report by Scott Baraban and colleagues, another group reported that if you test 
uh, 13 anti-epileptic drugs in the zebrafish PTZ assay, that 12 of them could show anticonvulsant properties. And this was using primarily the locomotor assay, however. Now, we had a bit of a problem with this paper in the sense that these different anti-epileptic drugs that were chosen and used have different modes of action. And the large majority of them actually do not work in the equivalent rodent model, making us question whether the zebrafish was actually uh, discriminatory enough, that whether it could actually distinguish between different modes of action of different drugs, and why would 12 out of 13 work when it doesn't even work in the equivalent rodent model? So we looked more carefully at the studies and came up with two main questions which we addressed in our study. And is it, can the larval zebrafish truly discriminate between compounds and different mechanisms of actions? And does the locomotor assay actually predict the true anti-epileptic activity of a compound? In other words, if you see an, a reduction in locomotor movement of a larva, treated with PTZ in the presence of a compound or an anti-epileptic drug, is that really an inhibition of, of convulsions or seizures? Or is it simply toxicity? Is the fish sedated? Is it paralyzed? Um, so those were important questions that we needed to address. Uh, those, knowing in the back of our minds, though, that some of these anti-epileptics cause sedation in humans. But we, we asked ourselves, would it be possible to choose a dose for the fish where sedation is not seen or any kind of locomotor impairment, and yet where we could still see the anticonvulsant effect? And so um, this is just a schematic. Essentially, we expose the, uh, the fish to compound for, a whole, for 18 hours, so overnight just to make sure that it gets in. Because this, these drugs ha are, are optimized for consumption by humans, and therefore they're not very lipophilic. And so the chance of them actually getting in is lower because of the log p values. But most of them actually still get in. Um, and then we t look for decreased touch response, loss of posture, which is basically that belly up or sideways, so they, they lose their balance, slow heart rate, and body deformations. And then we, so we looked at acute signs of toxicity after about 90 minutes, and then we repeated the screen the next day after 18 hours for delayed signs of toxicity, and we essentially chose the dose to use for our seizure assays um, where no toxicity was observed, and that's what we call the MTC, or the maximum tolerated concentration. Um, and this is just a schematic of basically, we would look under the microscope after treatment or with the, with the locomotor, um, automated locomotor system uh, to look for decreases in locomotion. And this very complicated looking slide is essentially just um, total larval locomotor activity. So each point is at least 12 larvae, uh, basically tracked for their locomotor activity over 60 minutes. Uh, and the blue curve is essentially vehicle plus pentylene tetrazole. And then this is just embryo medium or vehicle control. What you see here in the dashed lines are the confidence intervals. So you'll probably have noticed by now that within the first 15 minutes, you have a huge standard deviation. So the larvae in these first 15 minutes are actually still just responding to the pentylene tetrazole, but they're not in sync at all. So some respond earlier, some later, and there's a huge variability. But by minute 15 onwards, you see that the standard deviation decreases significantly, and pretty much if you were to record from each larval brain, every larva will be seizing by then. And you have a very consistent stereotypical behavior. Now you see there's a lot of people ask, why is there seen to be a decrease over time? Well, as you, as I, you saw in the movies, actually they reach different stages or intensities of seizure. And what we think is happening is that most of the fish are spending their time in the equivalent of status epilepticus, where basically they've gone belly up and therefore there's not a lot of swimming activity and they're, they're still undergoing seizures and you can record this, but they're not moving a lot. But it's pretty steady, so it never goes down to, to the level of controls. And so this determined pretty much our assay conditions 
where from minute five to minute 35 is when we perform the locomotor assay, and from minute 20 to minute 30, which is the peak of PTZ activity, is when we measure in the brain. So basically, uh, these areas, locomotor and EEG, overlap. And this is just a sampling of the many, many quantifications we did. Uh, we look at uh, the, the total larval movement over the 30-minute time frame, and as you see here, uh, the anti-epileptic drug or AED, valproic acid, uh, significantly reduced lo larval locomotor activity. And we also looked at five-minute intervals to, and, and just a more detailed analysis of, the, of every stage of locomotor activity, mainly because if you remember, the anti-epileptic drug was applied 18 to the day. Presumably, there will be no more increase. However, the assay is started when you add pentalytic the next day. And therefore, there's a massive infusion, a very high amount of PTZ. And as you see the curve here for PTZ-treated fish only, they're still responding and still increasing in their movement. And there's probably quite a bit of pentaline trastuzol still entering the brain, whereas the level of anti-epileptic is at a certain level. And so they're going to cross paths. Those are sort of a little bit of pharmacokinetics that we're trying to understand. And if you sum up uh, all the tests, so we basically tested 13 anti-epileptic drugs, and then aspirin is a control. These are the determined uh, MTCs, and this is uh, what turned up positive in the 30-minute integration interval and what turned up positive in the five-minute inter intervals. Essentially, only five tested positive, and uh, not 12, as it was reported by the other group. So that's already a big difference. So then the next question was, OK, we have our locomotor data. Can we correlate this anticonvulsant effect then now with, uh, with uh, anti-seizure? Well, can we see that in brain recordings or EEG recordings? And there are different ways of uh, quantifying EEGs. So what you can do is apply tetra pentaline tetrazole to the fish and wait until it undergoes seizures and then apply the drug. Uh, and that was what was done by Baraban and colleagues at University of California, San Francisco. And what they recorded was basically they quantified seizures uh, or decrease in seizures by the decrease in amplitude of the electrographic activity. The advantages of the system is that the anti-epileptic is applied to an already seizing brain and that the same fish acts as its own reference, as its own control in the setup. The drawback, of course, is that it's very difficult to classify these discharges. We tried that, actually, and even with advanced software. But the thing is, the seizures don't always look exactly the same. So you have to train software to identify a seizure and be able to measure it properly from start to finish. And it failed uh, in many instances. So we actually ended up doing it um, manually. And then we decided to find a different way to quantify the seizures. Uh, and then it takes uh, a long time per larva to do these types of experiments. So we decided to do it slightly differently. And this is more of what's done in uh, rat hippocamp hippocampal brain uh, slice cultures published by Duan Tono et al. Sorry, there's a typo there. Um, essentially, we co-incubate the proconvulsant with the AED, and we look at inter like discharges and ictal like discharges uh, and then we look at the duration and the frequency of the spikes and see if they decrease. Um, advantages here, it's very easy to classify and identify the paroxysm and quantify it, of course. And this has already been used multiple times in rodent models. So this is what our setup looks like. Uh, essentially, uh, this is a inverted microscope. The larva is there in a little dish. Uh, you basically um, embed it in soft agarose, and so it's porous enough, and those, so you can infuse pentaline tetrazole if you want, or any, whatever you want. Um, but we always pre-treat, and then we embed in agarose. Uh, the agarose keeps it from moving around, so it actually stays quite still, even though it's not anesthetized. So th that's simply that sort of physical um, enveloping of the agarose is enough to keep it still for the recording period. And we record at least 15 minutes, depending on the proconvulsant. 
uh, and then uh, quantify the seizures. So this is a sampling sort of fragments of the EEG recordings. This is vehicle only. So you can see some small spiking, but that's essentially background. In the presence of pentylene tetrazole, of course, you see clear seizures. And then in the presence of different anti-epileptic drugs, you can see tiagabin was quite good at suppressing seizure activity, as well as diazepam, which pretty much flatlined the whole time. But phenytoin was very ineffective in this seizure model. Um, and again, back to the quantification. Uh, so these are what we call interictal spikes. So these are smaller in amplitude. Uh, and essentially, interictal simply means the period between seizures, right? And this, we quantify it, it was, if it was three times uh, larger than background, and also the duration was three times longer than background. And these are ictal-like discharges, and those are the true seizures, right? And then this is just a summation of that, and essentially, uh, each, for each anti-epileptic, we, uh, we basically recorded from at least three, uh, normally five, six, or even seven larvae in order to get the quantification. And then, of course, we calculated for statistical significance. And as you see, a number of different anti-epileptic drugs were indeed able to suppress ictal and or interictal-like discharges in the brain. And we also looked at total cumulative duration of all types of epileptiform activity as well. So if you look at the overall uh, results, uh, comparing the zebrafish locomotor assay with that of the zebrafish EEG, we were able to uh, see a strong correlation for diazepam and ethosuximide. For other anti-epileptic drugs, it was negative. Uh, and I'll get back to that because it was actually expected because their mechanism of action is different from the ones that were positive and therefore expected to be negative in both the, the locomotor and the EEG assays. But we did have some false positives and false negatives. So tiagabin, for example, was negative, did not show any inhibition of locomotor response. However, it was positive in the EEG. And uh, topiramate and zonisamide, on the other hand, suppressed larval locomotor activity but did not show any seizure inhibition in the fish. But it, overall, 10 out of 13 basically correlated. So locomotor to EEG, there was a 10 out of 13 correlation. So why is that so? Well, anyway, uh, in any case, uh, if you look at how the GABAergic system works versus the anti epileptic drugs that actually were positive in our assays, so all of them target different aspects of GABA signaling. And you would expect that, because pentylene tetrazole is a GABA A receptor antagonist. And therefore, those drugs that target either the release, the transmission, or the production of GABA would therefore, should therefore work in this assay. Whereas others, such as carbamazepine uh, and similar ones, such as arcarbazepine, should not work because they're sodium channel inhibitors. So as I mentioned already, 10 out of 13 worked. This test system can reveal molecules with different targets within a pathway. Uh, there are false negatives in the locomotor tracking assay. However, I have to say that um, you have to imagine that these larvae are very small in a 96-well plate, and we're capturing all 96 in one instance. Um, so subtle behavior. They're also different proconvulsants, but basically they exhibit a lot of other seizure-like behaviors that are not picked up by our current tracking system. So we actually have that goes in and can zoom in on four to eight well plates and to pick up more subtle behaviors. So if we can actually refine our system to be more sensitive and pick up all these other seizure behaviors, we might be able to increase the amount actually picked up. So that's caveat there. And if we were to match all the results with what's published in the literature, about six out of nine matched perfectly with what is published for rodent, the equivalent rodent PSA. 
So uh, for a known or given anti-epileptic drug versus what the EEG recordings uh, gave. And so we got pretty good correlation, except for three, which is gabapentin. But here, gabapentin has a very, uh, it actually has a minus low. It's basically uh, not very lipophilic. And so we think it actually doesn't even get in the fish. So that's, a, of course, again, bioavailability, pharmacokinetics. That's a bit of a limitation currently. Oxcarbazepine was mildly active. Um, and that's a sodium channel blocker. And then primidone gave the false positive result. But otherwise, everything else correlated. Unfortunately, there was absolutely nothing in the literature for four anti-epileptic drugs with regard to the response to these anti-epileptics in rodent models, so we couldn't do a comparison. So to the sec second half of my talk, I just want to, uh, we've already published this recently in the April issue of Epilepsy and Behavior, and this is the discovery that the Sabaline sesquiterpenoids of curcuma longa uh, actually have an anticonvulsant activity in, in fish and, and uh, mouse seizure models. And uh, another name for, I don't know what it's called in Italian, curcuma? or turmeric, is everyone familiar with this? So it's, it's used in curries for making yellow and it's as, a, as a condiment. Uh, essentially, there are two, diff two main constituents or components, and that are the curcuminoids, which make up about three to 5% of turmeric powder. It comes from the plant curcuma longa, and we've used the rhizomes from that. Uh, and so this is the structure, and uh, Curcuminoids consists of curcumin, desmethoxycurcumin, and bisdesmethoxycurcumin. But another major component are the volatile And that makes about 2 to 7%. And these are the bisaboline sesquiterpenoids. So aryl, alpha beta turmeron, curlone, and alpha atlantone. And these are very uh, volatile. And uh, our PhD student, Adriana, uh, she's from Ecuador, and uh, she had a really hard time getting enough of this for the mouse assays because they're very volatile. So she would try to purify it only to discover the next day that they had disappeared because everything had evaporated. So we had to be very creative in, in basically trying to isolate and purify enough for our assays, but we managed in the end. Um, now, curcumin has already been reported to be active in iron-induced epileptogenesis maximal electroshock tests, and kyanic acid-induced pantaline tetrazole kindling models. However, what's limited its development as a drug is its bioavailability, its pharmacokinetic properties. Uh, it has very, very poor uptake, and it hasn't really gone beyond phase one clinical trials. So that was, of course, for the groups that were working on this all these years. Um, but no one has really ever studied turmeric oil. And uh, essentially, we thought, well, why don't not try it? It's a quick and easy assay. Uh, and we already knew that other essential or volatile oils could exhibit anticonvulsant properties. And as you see, if we actually purify curcuminoids and test it in our zebrafish locomotor assay, it has a nice inhibitory effect of pentaline tentrazole induced seizures that's dose responsive, but so does turmeric. And so we decided to investigate this further. Uh, peaks using HPLC, uh, basically aril turmeron, which is peak four, which corresponds to this peak here, uh, makes up about 22.5% of the of the oil, whereas uh, alpha-beta turmeron could not be separated because they're isomers of each other, so there's a bit of an equilibrium, so you have to really isolate them together, and that's peak five. And then there was a small percentage of alpha-atlantone, which corresponds then to peak six. And if you test the individual sesquiterpenoids now, all of them give an anticonvulsant effect. So aryl turmeron, in fish, alpha beta turmeron as well, and even alpha atlantone, with very, very little toxicity, actually. So the, the, the ratio of toxicity to efficacy was actually quite, re quite reasonable. 
Now, of course, this is all fish work. We wanted to see, can it do the same in a mouse model? And so we use the equivalent pentylene tetrazole uh, seizure assay, where essentially using a double pump system, in the first instance, we infuse the sesquiterpenoid or a test compound through the tail vein uh, in the mouse, as you see here. So it's restrained and then you inject a small catheter and basically pump in a, a very defined rate the amount of compound. You wait then another 15 minutes and then you infuse through the lateral tail vein, so the other side, with another pump, then pentylene tetrazole, right? Now in an un so in a naive mouse, untreated, if you were to just give it pentylene tetrazole at this infusion rate and this concentration, it would exhibit a specific set of seizure parameters in this order and at a certain given time. So it's a very fast reproducible assay where you could expect to see initial ear twitching, myoclonus, tail twitch, forelimb clonus, falling, tonic hind limb extension, which is basically the gone mal seizures, and then ultimately death. So this always occurs between two and a half and three minutes in this assay. Very, very reliable. And I'm emphasizing this because what you measure essentially is if your client is acting neuroprotective, or it's going to be for them to reach these different parameters, seizure parameters. And the whole time, this is your time in this, uh, in, for this to occur in each mouse, PTZ is being pumped at a regular rate. So there's more and more PTZ infusing d directly into the cardiovascular system, essentially, uh, uh, into the mouse. And this is a bit of an unusual way of depicting things, but essentially what you should, the light gray area uh, corresponds to controls, right? And so this is sort of the outer limit of when they would die. Uh, and then the larger the area surrounding it, which is the, the sesquiterpenoid or oil-treated uh, mice, then the longer it took for the, the mice to reach those different seizure stages and then death. And as you see, for turmeric oil, it has a modest effect, about 50% longer. Uh, for 100, so twice as much dose, essentially you get to twice, so it takes them six minutes instead of three to die. Um, and if we take the individual sesquiterpenoids, such as alpha-beta turmeron at 100 mg per kilogram and uh, aryl turmeron at 50 mg per kilogram, you can see that it actually has a slightly different uh, profile, activity profile, and that even extends beyond 200% uh, of that of normal. Um, there is one thing that I need to mention here, and that is for ethical reasons, we actually stop the assay at six minutes uh, because the, they are undergoing some seizures and, and uh, you could go on. But I have to say that, uh, so it always, you know, one reviewer for this paper said, why did you stop at six minutes? You could have gone longer to see how longer you could have protected the mice, right? And explained, of course. But Adriana, when she first learned these assays, was not told by the other more senior PhD student who that you're supposed to stop it at six minutes. So we had something interesting when she ran into the office excitedly and said, I have a mouse that survived and it's been 13 minutes. So then I said, you're not supposed to do it. You have to stop it at six minutes. And I explained, of course, uh, but that's very good to know. And so, you know, if you, ex actually they do survive longer. That's the point. Um, anyway. Um, so now we're actually investigating uh, whether the sesquiterpenoids will work in various seizure models. And uh, it's, it's very attractive as a potential uh, structural group for drug development, simply because toxicity studies have already been done. Arilterumarone has been determined using at least in silico analysis that it very, has very nice drug-like properties. And it's been used as a condiment by all over the world for who knows how long, and clearly there are no toxicity issues there. So um, the next two 
so Adriana is actually currently testing them now in the six hertz model and together with a collaborator in Grenoble who we will be visiting tomorrow um, that we're going to try to convince them to test it in their MTLE model because these are actually very favored models right now. A lot of anti-epileptic drugs currently do not work in these models and only a small handful such as Levitir Acetam or Kepra as it's known from UCB Pharma has worked in this model and this model. And uh, so the idea is to try to find novel by uh, running it through a battery of known seizure assays and looking at its profile and if it differs from the current anti-epileptics and perhaps we have something new. So, uh, and that, of course, some structural activity uh, analysis is being done then with some collaborative, some organic chemists at the university in Leuven and we hope to be able to test more analogs uh, to, to basically improve its efficacy further. And thank you. For